Hello and welcome to the next episode of Horse Players Happy Hour. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, with you in the Brooklyn Bunker once again, uh, joined from an undisclosed location in New England with those uh, pretty panel boards behind him there. He is a man, you know him from his own podcast, you know him from his guest appearances on other shows on the In The Money Media Network, and you know him from his work on uh, the small screen there. TV's Matt Bernier. Matt, how are you? I'm good, Pete. Uh, looking forward to week number two of the tour. It looks like we've got another good turnout on deck, and there's still some time for those of you trying to get involved. Um, but yeah, looking forward to it. I was just telling producer Craig, I got my my first shot yesterday, so excited about that, feeling good. Um Arm's not feeling great, but you know what? It's a small pipe price to pay, so we can get back to sort of more normal things. It seems they, like. they say if you if you move it around, you can you can you can help with that. I don't know if you want to do that during the broadcast. It might look a little strange, <laughs> but I think that it can help somehow. That's supposed to help uh, dissipate it, and and that's great news. Uh, it's fantastic to hear that you're on that uh, that track as we start to turn the corner here back towards normalcy. I will attempt to hustle. Some more entries for our contest in a moment. But first, let's tell folks what we're here for. Horse Players Happy Hour. This is a weekly opportunity with three chances to win your way into the Breeders' Cup betting challenge. The first one, the traditional one, like we did all of last year, where you buy a $20 t uh, ticket seat to today's feeder contest. And the top finishers, the top 10%, so that's looking like a real healthy number, is are going to win their way into the weekend qualifier, an event from which you can get your $10,000 Breeders' Cup betting challenge seat. But new to the party this year are the two uh, new ways to win your way to the BCBC via our playoffs and tour. What are the playoffs and tour? Well, the top two finishers in our Horse Player Happy Hour games each week will automatically qualify for our playoffs. And then we have this whole tour as well. You can earn points every week. And in addition to those two players finishing in the exacta who get into the playoffs, our top, our next, I think it's going to be 40 tour finishers who haven't already punched their seats there will be able to win their way in. So that, that's one great way. And then, of course, the overall winner on the tour itself Get a Breeders' Cup betting challenge seat for that. So three ways to win, and this money added to the prize pool. It's not like we're asking you to come out of pocket to participate in the tour. That's all happening because of In the Money Media and our friends over at the Breeders' Cup. Uh, we were very pleased with the reaction week one. I think we had about 285, and who knows? With, with a few minutes before we get started here, we've still got 11 minutes to Gulfstream's fifth first race in this contest. Uh, maybe we can approach that number. Once again, we encourage folks to go to horseplayers.com, look for our Horse Players Happy Hour game, put in your picks, and follow along with us. It's going to be a lot of fun. You've still got 10 minutes, like I said, so you can do a little cursory handicapping if you haven't done it yet. But, heck, if all else fails, you're in good shape, even if you just take your favorite number and decide to play that one because I should have mentioned this earlier, the rake – it's not going to us. It's going to charity. So it's going to go to the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance and the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundations, our two aftercare partners. They do great work. There are so many reasons to play in this contest, not least because you can follow along with us over the course of the 90 minutes or so where we're going to give our thoughts on all these races and hopefully cash some tickets. Matt Bernier was en fuego last week. I, uh, it, was, it, was, it was great for me. My picks were meh, but uh, I still made money just listening to him. So hopefully that'll be a winning formula for you out there uh, today as well. Um, Matt, what are your thoughts coming into this second week of the Horse Players Happy Hour Tour actual contest? You know, it's still early on. I mean, like you say, we're only in week two of the, of the regular season, but I'm hopeful this is a sign of things to come. Just the fact that last year we talked about it, how there, there wasn't any real continuity week, to, week in and week out. Things just sort of, you know, it was come and go. If you're around, great. If not, not the end of the world. I think we're already seeing, I think this is, I'm hopeful anyway, a bit of signal here that we can look at and say, this is something we can project going forward that, in all likelihood, we're going to be close to this sort of number on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, it, I would say at the very least until we start getting people who have eight confirmed scores going toward your overall total. So um, I'm excited about it. I, I was really optimistic. I think you and I both were when we first started chatting about this this prospect, about what the overall sort of turnout would be. And, I mean, it, it's, it's wildly exceeding even what my hopeful expectations were. It, it's been off to a great start. And 
I think the beautiful thing is, and, and this was part of our hope anyway, was the the diehard seasoned, you know, positive EV sort of player is going to look at this and say, this is a great opportunity, but also this is a great opportunity for the folks who are new to this world and want to try to dip a toe in and a combination of, if you want to come and listen to this, you know, just for the afternoon, if you want to have a, a you know, an adult beverage or two <laughs> along, <laughs> along with us, I got the props this week too. Um, you know, I think it is a nice way to get involved and, and sort of figure things out on the fly. Maybe you don't all of a sudden become a master tournament player overnight, but this is a good way to start. And you're cutting your teeth against some of the best of the best. So, I, look, I'm thrilled, as you can tell. I, I was happy last week. I'm just as happy this week that we have this many, uh, th this large number it's, of people getting involved. It's great to see. And it's great to chat with people as well. We had some good conversation going in the chat uh, last week, we've got a comment from Steven Lopez already. Real horse players in here. I love it. Steven, we love it too. And we encourage folks to, to make comments along the way. Maybe we'll, we'll tee them up. We'll tee them up with a question. I'm absolutely nicking this from, from somebody else's Twitter, but, but I thought it was a good conversational topic to ask people out there in the world. And we could talk about it throughout the show today. Folks, let us know your, your let's call it your most meaningful gambling win it doesn't have to be your biggest score it could be but just something uh something that happened to you at the windows that is memorable that you'd want to share with the audience go ahead and drop that in the comments of course if you have any questions about uh racing going on this weekend i'll admit i'm a little uh late to the part not late to the party i haven't quite i'm not i wouldn't call myself studied up on saturday yet but we can talk about that uh and we're very studied up on the races that are happening today the seven races that are going to be part of today's show a little bit leaner and meaner than last week's uh two hour 15 marvel movie length we're, we're, we're back sort of you know we're, we're more like in the in the rom-com you know 95 minutes uh, this week so we'll, we'll, but but still plenty of time it'll be it'll be fast and furious with the races but plenty of time to chat and answer your questions as well so let, let us know where you are let us know a meaningful gambling win that you had and uh and we'll keep the conversation going and, and throughout the throughout the show let me say this matt we talked about you mentioned about the ev opportunity in this contest um, th that's such a cool thing. We're seeing today's kind of a fun day where there were two announcements from around the industry of what I have to call positive developments for horse players. Now, I don't want to be too Pollyannish about it. I don't need to pump blue sky all over the place and, and say <laughs> that, the, that the tide is turning. There's still a lot of work to be done to get uh, horse players, I think, acknowledged to as the people who the role that we play in this industry. But it is good to see some positive developments happening, uh, one of them. Naira going back to the to the one dollar pick six uh, with the with the traditional with the traditional takeout uh, with a lower takeout than the traditional takeout, which I like to see. And then this news from Canterbury, already industry low, going even lower with their pick five at their upcoming meet down to ten percent. I'm super excited to uh, to talk about that, and you know, hopefully elsewhere on the in the Money Media Network as this year goes along. Uh, those are both wagers that that we can highlight i know you like me are a big believer in game selection we were talking about a little bit off air about an, an arcane matter before we before we started but uh, the idea if you can choose carefully where you play uh, that's going to greatly increase your chance of victory sometimes um even more than having a good or clever opinion will yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I also look at these moves that these two entities made, which I applaud. I mean, I think, again, we, we talked about it with this contest and this sort of this regular season and postseason situation. It's only going to work if it's supported by the players and then the powers that be can take, you know, look at things, evaluate and make decisions going forward. I also can't help but think part of this has to the sports betting aspect plays into this because we've talked about it for quite some time that one of racing's big problems is just the pricing. It's a very expensive game to play from a takeout standpoint. And I think these moves are the sort of moves that whether it's directly related to it or not, there has to be some connection to the idea of, you know, we need to make this, I don't want to say a more appetizing situation or scenario for players, but, but it is just that. It's one of those where now all of a sudden that play at Canterbury becomes can't miss. You have to be involved all the time. And as far as Naira goes, 
while it's not going all the way back to the $2 pick six, I do like the $1 pick six as sort of the happy medium where, no, you're not going to dilute the pool so much that you've got 20 cent base bets and all of a sudden there's a million people involved. But it is enough where, you know what, you can still play along with, four, you know, $5,400 kind of ticket, but you're also going to get those big players that come involved because they look at it and say, if we get a couple of prices in here, this thing, we can scoop the pool on any given day. So I just, I think there are a lot of positives. And again, it goes back to the idea of it's all player driven. What we support these sort of where our money goes is ultimately where the changes are going to happen. So I think supporting these things is critical to the longevity of this entire thing. One of our most commonly used phrases somewhere between JK tries math fails and Divisadero on our, on our list is vote with your dollar. Yeah. And the players have certainly been doing that with the horse players happy hour so far. Our numbers continue to grow. We'll give a recap on that. Still, a couple of minutes to get involved. We encourage you, if you're on the fence, take an extra entry. Um, put it in there. Remember, the VIG goes to charity. You increase your, your chances of doing well. With three minutes to post, we should talk about Gulfstream's fifth race, Matt. We are on the dirt going one mile, three and up fillies and mares, maiden 12 fives. Um, I have a, a boring idea and a crazy idea, but let's start with your idea of what's going to win this race. I lean more toward crazy in here. For me, this is the sort of race I, I have a really difficult time with these types, especially when the horses who have run haven't shown me a great deal. Uh, that just sort of inherently leads me to look for a fresh face, even if maybe the pedigree isn't there or the connections typically strike sort of on the lighter side of things. I, I went to the seven. Tammany, Tommy, however you'd like to pronounce that, uh, first-time starter for a barn that doesn't typically win like this, doesn't really have a ton of stock in the grand scheme of things. Um, but what I've seen from some of the other horses to this point, I haven't been blown away by. And I feel like this horse really just needs to be respectable to have a chance to get involved with this thing. And at 23 to 1, again, it's not like I'm sitting here saying this is a, a very likely winner. But if I don't love everyone else and I'm getting a price on a fresh face, give me the 7 in this spot. That was my crazy horse, uh, Constitution. It all comes down to Constitution for me. So, so good with first-time starters in a nondescript field. I know nothing about the, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I know nothing about the horse, but what we know about the ones that have run uh, makes me want to take a shot at a big price. If you're playing multi-race bets, you want to get some doubles started. I mean, the favorite's just so obvious. A figure edge, a pace edge, second off the claim and layoff. I like the fact that Jaramillo sticks around. The form of that last race for the level actually working out decently. A couple of those came back to run second at least. Not exciting. Not a horse I'm going to be betting to win, but uh, one that I will start some start some backup doubles. Let's hope we can get this price in here with the, the, the big long shot that Matt and I came up with, and that's the, that's the seven Tammany. And the reason I'm not completely against betting Hot Babe, I just – I think the market is maybe actually nine to two is getting is getting more like the price, but Addy the five to me is just getting that career maiden look, and I feel like you can make a case. You can look at the bare form and say, wait a second, this horse didn't break and still got within two lengths of a horse that, that's even money. Doesn't that make Addy a good bet? But running down the PP lines of Addy, this this was not an unlucky slow start. This is a this is a habit and a habit that can be very, very tough to break, especially for a horse at this level. I'm expecting another off-slow half a length from Addy, and, and I feel like that the nine, even at 9-2, to two, maybe just a, a hair over bet, helping make the market a little bit for Hot Babe, at least in terms of playing a bet like the doubles. So we'll, we'll start those doubles there, and we'll do a little win money with Tammany. I, I feel no reason to uh, particularly mess around. And I don't mind for, if you do want to follow me in, anybody out there on this double. I thought Zap Daddy, the five in race six, was a little bit interesting. We'll talk more about that race as we get closer. But uh, I might as well have a little one seven with five in the double. And uh, let's go ahead and bet the seven to win. Any thoughts on a wagering approach for you here, Matt? Or just keep, keep it simple situation? I, I would say more of sort of a philosophical piece. These are the sort of races for me that I'm not opposed to taking sort of a wild card in here again, because of what we loaded to, you know, the, the horses that have run, they haven't really done a heck of a lot or they don't necessarily warrant such heavy favoritism in here. I agree with you. Hot babe is the most likely winner of the race. I really don't think there's much arguing that, but 
at even money for a horse who, yes, she has every right to improve second off the bench, shows some speed. I would assume Jaramillo just sends and says, come and catch me. Again, that's the sort of running style that fits this track profile. And at this low maiden claiming level, I mean, I think you just want to be the one cutting out the fractions. But at this level, I am very interested in taking a shot with horses who – at first blush, you wouldn't think twice of, but you do a little bit more of a, you don't even have to do a deep dive on the horse themselves, but you just go through and you say, okay, well, this horse is a career maiden. This one is looking like a career maiden. The speed, yes, makes sense, but I don't know that warrants, you know, a 50-50 shot as far as the win end is concerned. Let me take a shot with a horse that who knows if they just come out of the gate running at any reasonable level, they got a shot to, I would say bare minimum hit the board. I like to use the speed figure pars as they just uh, pop from the gate at Gulfstream. Did you see what kind of – uh, it looks like we didn't get the best of breaks on the seven. But uh, the, the buyer speed figure pars, they don't exist for every level, but uh, gone through the exercise of trying to estimate them for different class levels. And this race usually would be one with about a 55. So even Hot Babe's best number isn't there. So, so, th so it is tough when you're talking about getting down – to playing one that's uh that's a pretty heavy favorite at that kind of number. Uh, Tammany uh, didn't seem to have the smoothest of breaks, but is is running you know is running okay. Hot Babe uh, didn't break the greatest either, but sort of inherited the lead. It looked like everybody was grabbing there, and and we'll see we'll see if Tammany has any run at all here in in the next furlong or so. And I mean, again, if you had given me this setup at the start I, I would have signed up for it immediately now it looks like she's going backwards but it's a race that i'm not going to be disappointed in hot babe going out there and it looks like right now barring somebody really picking it up or her stopping completely she's probably going to win rather comfortably I, this isn't one though that i'm going to look back on and say oh, i should have done this differently or i should have done that i'll do this every time in these sort of races and recognize that you know what when you don't have a super strong opinion you're not supposed to go all out in these situations. Now, maybe I anointed her a little early, but <laughs> she's uh, stopping pretty bad. I think it's going to maybe be the the one I uh, did. I not. Oh no, that's not the one I knocked. This is this is this Carrick coming down the center. Um, who, who might get it? But but yeah, I know what you're saying. It looked like she was going to run off and win by ten. And even if that happened, it's not like you made a mistake. That would be a case of a race where you you. You know, you got to pass winners sometimes. That's a the yep. great line in Mike Maloney's betting with an edge. If you're not passing winners, you're betting too many races. Don't ever s start second guessing yourself um, in that situation. Now we are moving immediately over to Keeneland, Matt. Do you have a quick thought on this one uh, before they pop? Yeah. I, I like this horse quite a bit in here, actually. The number five, Argentello for Connor Murphy. I thought the run down at the fairgrounds most recently, super confident ride from BJ Hernandez. Uh, there was no pace in the race, and this horse was still able to go and rally from off of it. Um, I also think in one of the rare instances, I disagree with the Timeform US rating. I know pace-wise, when they adjusted it, the number was considerably faster. But I, I, I tend to think that race is much better. The fifth-place finisher came back out and uh, ran earned a 96 buyer in the next start. The seventh place finisher was the next out winner on dirt with a 92. Uh, I don't love nine to two. I think I, I think that's about fair. But I mean, it just heads up. I would take the five over the 11. Uh, Chad's horse is seven to five every day. Give me the 12. Bye bye, Melvin, in here off the break. Um, hopefully, if anybody was, uh, hopefully uh, this horse can uh, get the job done. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see if there's some improvement from three to four. And I love, um, Love motion coming off these breaks at a meet like Keeneland and was hoping for a kind of a positive trip here. Now, um, I'm not sure about getting hung out uh, three, four wide uh, on the turn, but uh, hopefully we can tuck in and save some ground the rest of the way. Are you happy with uh, you happy with where, where you are with your five? I mean, a little bit tight early on, throwing the head about, but now we've kind of settled down toward the rear uh, on the inside. Still a little bit keen up on heels, but I, they're going an honest enough clip. I would say now again, I haven't been glued to Keeneland early on. I am playing in another contest, but I haven't really been, you know, locked into how the track is playing. So maybe this is not an advantageous position, but from a from a pace standpoint, I, I don't think that's going to be an issue. No, it's going to lots going to unfold here. It's interesting. It's the clock says it's faster than I would have guessed that it is. I, I like where Bye Bye Melvin is now, just sort of sitting, running comfortably, head down. We'll we'll see if if uh, there's any horse here when they uh, when the real running starts. Looks like on the clock they slowed it down in that in that second quarter. Yeah, from what I've seen of Keeneland, it's that typical, you know, the 
the the rail the rail on turf has been neutral neutral at best I would say one of the reasons I really I didn't hate um, the draw either for for bye bye Melvin the twelve. Let's just see if we got any run here too. What looks like is that the uh, is that lovely gray Chad's horse uh, Gray's Creek coming down the center? Yeah, it looks like it. I but mean, it's un it's unfolding a bit. Some some things might happen uh, from in behind here. Uh, let's I see. Mean, if Melvin I mean, I've got run forward. late, but it's too late. I think we're just gonna maybe third. Oh, I'm getting pipped. That's funny. I thought Chad was making the winning move. Meanwhile, my runner kept finding down at the inside, but in the end, uh, no match. No match for the three who gets the nose down on the line. Uh, let me pull up the PPs and see what we're looking at there. Midnight tea time. Joe Sharp's barn keeps uh, rolling along here. This is a horse that was defeated by Argentel in the most recent run. Um, you know, a tactical, and it's easy for me to say it's going to sound like red boarding or sour grapes or whatnot. I, th I think there's a case to be made that Argentella was best in here, and I'm going to make a note for when the horse comes back because it'll look like taking on, I don't want to say better company, but I uh, couldn't quite get there. When in reality, given the trip, I, I think it was a pretty good effort. Yeah, trouble early. You were a bit bottled up and had run late. It was just the, the bird had flown. I, I agree. Not a bad one to um, not a bad one to mark up there. That that's a race that's going to need repeat watching to come up with uh, some thoughts on the trips. We've got one minute to race number five at the Big A. Um, I I kind of like misty taste in this race. The five. A bit by default, there was just a lot that I didn't like about other runners, and I liked that she had closed and won, and I thought there might be enough pace to set it up. We just saw Irad in the previous race come from uh, come from off the pace, so it, it's not uh, not an impossible situation. It's not one of these uh, conveyor belt speed days with the sloppy sealed track at the Big A. What did you think was going to win? Yeah, I also landed on Misty Taste in here. You know, that most recent run, while it may not look great on paper, it, it was basically a merry-go-round. There really wasn't much running happening in that spot. And sure, she looked beat with about a half mile to go, but I like that she did stick around and she actually picked up a little bit of ground on the runner-up there at the end. So, you know, who knows? This, this is not a, a fantastic group of runners, but it, similar to the run we just saw down at Gulfstream, I, I mean, is the class relief for Choose Happiness – the only reason, because on paper, I don't see any reason this horse should be evens compared to some of the other runners in here. She can win, but I just don't think, if you just told me 50-50 shot she wins, I would say that that's not accurate in my opinion. Do you agree? Uh, I, I would I'd bet the, the pass line. I'd lay much yeah, sooner I, than I would just, back at even money. I mean, that's that's aggressive. I just, and that's, I, to me, that's what the whole, I mean, that's that's what playing the horses is all about. And, or just gambling in general. You're trying to find some sort of an edge or, or sort of exploit weaknesses or inefficiencies in the market. And she can win. Same as that even money horse down at Gulfstream. She, she could have won. She didn't, though. And and I think long run, you're supposed to be looking for, for horses that are going to offer overlaid prices. And in this case, I don't, I don't love Misty Taste, if I'm being honest, but I she would be where I would go in here at 6-1. to one. 6 to 1, I think, is a fair price on one who should hopefully get the right kind of trip in this spot. I'm a, I'm a little confused about the betting on, on Choose Happiness and why it is so uh, so aggressive. Second start for the new barn. Um, is it a red? Uh, what's that? Is it just a red? Like it, it, uh, that's probably some of it, right? I mean, he he'll catch money. I think that you know people have seen uh, what the Nota Barn's capable of doing in their hot streaks in New York. Um, it's a weak field, but this almost feels like a a default a default six to five shot. And and again, like the the big favorite we were talking about in in the previous race. I I yeah look. I mean, hey, I, I co-designed a, a T-shirt called. Uh, chalk eating weasel i'm not opposed <laughs> to the short end of the odd spectrum but I, I want the horse to click all the boxes and choose happiness doesn't for me I'm just going to try to get out just a little token wager with uh with misty taste i am this is the kind of thing that does start to dr try to maybe draw me to get a little bit more involved in doubles if you were going to put some doubles together who, who else would you want to would you want to throw in there i mean i'd probably use Love me tomorrow. She she hasn't always shown the biggest heart, but she should be out there on the lead. I'd probably want some sevens. Any other numbers you'd put uh, going forward in doubles? The, the only other one that, you know, maybe just – yeah, the, the only other one maybe from a pace standpoint that I would throw in would be the three, wear my ring. Now, again, the horse hasn't really shown it. a great deal on the track in the afternoon, but can be forwardly placed. And, and again, 
you know, sloppy sealed tracks. I think, I think anything can happen. Chaos can rain. So, um, and she's a perfect one for one on a wet track. So she Double would be the other odds. one I would throw in if you're playing some. I yeah. like that. And then I, I'd tie him up with uh, my Roxy girl in the next, um, who I think should uh, should get the right kind of trip in that spot. So that, that small, we'll, we'll punch in some small doubles here at Aqueduct. Um, uh, and and it's, it's, it's probably late, late now, but for anybody looking forward, I like Bank Sting in the next at Aqueduct. So b- between the two of us, I, th- I think we probably have the winner in the next, but you know what? <laughs> I probably just had us uh, complete the reverse exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it does go that way sometimes. It, there's no doubt about it. All right, they're off here. As expected, Love Me Tomorrow, assuming the lead. And Choose Happiness has a, a, f- a forward spot, but not necessarily the most comfortable forward spot in the world there for your uh, for your favorite. Who did drift? Drifted out to eight to five. Where's Misty Taste? Misty Taste looks to be in an okay spot. Um, yeah. It should be, should be um, if, I, if I'm looking at the right horse, should be clean out there and uh, like to share a third right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, kind of it, to your point, in the clear, I think that's arguably the most important piece in any of these, these sloppy tracks where the last thing you want is getting stuff just thrown back in your face. Now, maybe she's not going to run, but I think she has as good an opportunity to run as she possibly can in a position like this. I would agree with that. Well, we'll we're getting the trip, we're getting the trip we want now. It's a question of uh, are we good enough? Boy, Beyond Brown has gotten some trip. I I looked expecting a good run through, but also expecting not to be uh, not to be good enough. Let's see. The favorite has a nice opening down at the inside. If good enough, but uh, Love Me Tomorrow looks to be hey, finding I don't, more. I, uh, we're flattening out. I, I I don't know that we're totally done yet. Uh, it's, they're gonna have to come back, but 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 the, the horse is finishing a big, big favorite finishing two now. Um, we'll see. It looks it's down it's down to two with us in third, and it looks like the big is gonna pick up. Love me tomorrow in the shadow of the wire, and it'll come one seven five, which will enable us to take our first breath of the show, Matt. That's kind of fun <laughs> having the three races back to back, but it's good because we now we now have a minute to check in with some listeners and, and get their, uh, get their stories and, and hear what's going on. So let's see. Uh, Tom Espinosa. Good to see Tom in. Uh, hopefully he's not going to cause any marital strife as he predicts. We, <laughs> we are not available for, for consultation on, on vis-a-vis divorce decrees and whatnot. We'll, we'll we could find somebody for you though in the audience, I'm sure. Um, Gary Fitzpatrick answering our question about most memorable gambling wins. Um, talking about uh, 2012, at Churchill Downs, there you see it up on screen, having that Oaks Derby double ten times. Not bad. Is that is that the picture right back there? That's I'll have another right there. There, there he is. Very nice. Very nice. That's a good uh, good angle. The classic angle with the twin spires in the background, and, and Gary might have that picture hanging up too. <laughs> uh, I would think with that nice uh, believe you can. Um, I'll have another Oaks Derby double. My, mine, uh, we mentioned pictures, so I'll throw my my favorite in in there as well. So my toughest beat, I would say, not in terms of money, but like emotionally toughest beat, we've talked about it before on the show, was probably the Farrow Travers pick six, mm-hmm. a bet where, you know, we, we, we were live to the world to, to, you know, a one to five shot. And then to compound my misery in the morning I had planned on, coming back in pick fours, backing up with Keen Ice for the meltdown scenario, and just super confident and arrogant for some reason after the second leg of the pick six, decided not to do it. Anyway, I always joke there's a chalk outline of me at the paddock bar from, from where <laughs> I fell. But the it was I don't remember if it was the next year or two years later, that, that pick six, it was like the chance to right an old wrong and to be able to absolutely wallop a pick six with a giant group of uh, friends involved in a ticket uh, JK and I conceived together that day. Um, and, and to have it all pay off with Lady Eli somehow made it like even more fun and cool. And I did, to the key uh, ringleaders of that bet, I, I bought everybody um, Lady Eli pictures. That One of those great shots of uh, I read uh, patting her after the wire and, and distribute it to the group. That's my, that's my most uh, memorable uh, gambling win. But we've got a few others in here. Oh, Gene. Gene Gasoline, Gene Menez, this is great, uh, tell, telling us about the 1983 Kentucky Derby, nine years old in the post-parade saw a horse with the orange and white silks. <laughs> that was his favorite color, so he picked him. 
Dad said he won't win. Sonny's Halo began. He says his journey into this crazy game, I'm tempted to say his, uh, you know, descent into degeneracy. But in either case, Gene, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Chris Couples, who I had the pleasure of meeting out at the NHC, mentions Bar of Gold and Amiz Mesa. Uh, lots of exactas. Pick three. Um, never hit a pick three that plays anywhere close to that one again. You never know, Chris. Don't, uh, you know, you find you beat two odds on shots in a sequence or something. You, you, can, uh, you can get that job done. Uh, potentially. Uh, Susie and Brian will say hi to you for chiming in. We ask everybody watching to, to drop us a note and let us know what's going on. And oh yes, we have a leaderboard and a familiar name uh, near the top of it. Um, let me pull this up on my screen, Craig, actually, so I can read it easier. Um, and then we'll get to it. Unless, Matt, you, you're, you're young. You probably can read those names better than me. I got you. So first, right now, it's 7280, a big start for Eric uh, Kurzol. Uh, second, Peter Dressens, Massachusetts native. He's at 5380. There's a number of 5380 individuals. Uh, Stephen Walsh, Ernest Hay Jr., uh, Thomas Nanny, uh, Michael Domabil, uh, John Gasper is in seventh at 3460. Then we have uh, a handful of folks at 2760. Trish Smith, uh, Daniel Edwards, David Searman, uh, Mike Baychok, and Ed DeRosa rounding out your sort of Tied for top 10 piece there. Basil is in just behind at $26. Uh, Edward Reedy, Mark Jacobson, John Maslin, Matt Miller, Mark Wilgard, uh, Bob Schrader. We, I mean, we've got a number of folks in that sort of within, let's call it five to six dollars of the top 10 anyway, as far as getting points are concerned. And we're all we're not even halfway home yet. So long way to go. But uh, Eric Kurzel is off to a hot start. Great to see so many uh, friends of the show, people we know well up there towards the, the top of the leaderboard, folks who've been on the airways and been in contact with us many times. Uh, fantastic to see and fantastic to see some new names. Again, Matt mentioned earlier, one of the hopes with this project is to, to be able to to give new people a, a way in and a way not just to participate in these games, but uh, also to become part of this little community we're hoping to to create with these shows. So uh, have you had a chance, Matt, to look ahead to anything this weekend that's coming up? The only thing that I have done just sort of the, you know, bare bones on just simply because I kind of know the horses offhand is the, the showdown between, you know, Monomoy girl and, and Swiss skydiver and, and Latruska. You don't want to give her short shrift either simply because for no other reason, I mean, she's very talented in her own right, but she's controlling speed. I think she goes right to the front. I think the question now is, is she good enough to hold off not just one, but two of the big girls? And um, I think this will also be, to me anyway, I'm curious your thoughts. You know, a horse like Monomoy Girl, I think that if there is a knock, which I think, you know, few and far between if you can find one, but she's never run an exceptionally fast race. She is fast. She's good. I love that she just wins all the time. I think she's, all, she's a first ballot Hall of Famer. She's never run that, you know, big gaudy number where a horse like Swiss skydiver, she's run some pretty large numbers in the grand scheme of things, especially given the fact that she's a young four-year-old. Um, I mean, is there any concern that Swiss skydiver still has more in the tank and we've seen the best of Monomoy girl? Oh, this is a tough one from a gambling point of view. I mean, we should punch up what the early betting, if we can get some international betting on it. I mean, they're both so good. I'm, uh, I'm sort of, loathe to bet i'm sort of loathe to bet against either one of them based on just the the toughness that we know they have i mean even the the, the down swiss skydiver runs have have reasons to be to be down um you, i think i think it's i'm just hoping for the epic showdown but and I don't. It's hard for me to dial too deeply into a, a handicapping opinion unless I see something strange in the odds. I, I I have trouble separating them honestly. But I mean, you mentioned Latruska. What what sort of chance do you give her? And at what price would she become the bet in this race? It's dangerous for me to sit here and say she's not as talented as the other two, simply because she she deserves she deserves consideration just based on her overall body of work, but. I would also be lying if I if I thought she actually was of the same caliber of the top two girls. Now, given her theoretical tactical advantage, you know, I, I think I can pull up PPs and price it out, actually. It'd be a fun little exercise that we can do. Am I heart of hearts? 
I can't imagine anything less than five to one, nine to two, somewhere in there, knowing that the top two girls are both going to be probably in that seven to five, eight to five ish range, maybe even shorter than that, maybe evens in six to five. But I, I can't imagine I would be willing to take anything less than, you know, five, per, five to one puts you roughly in that 16, 17% chance of winning scenario. If she's able to streak out to the front and just take him a long way, then yeah, I mean, I, I can see a scenario, but I don't think she has a better chance than that of actually beating both of them. The other thing is, it's not like Monomoy Girl, some stone from for the Latrusca point of view. It's not like she's some stone closer. I, I don't, I don't see them letting her get away. It's not like uh, Brad Cox and and Florent Giroux don't have the PPs in front of them too. You know, totally. So the, the the that's what I think is going to make it tough for Latrusca for me. Six to one or higher, I I would I would certainly think about uh, becoming a wise guy and trying to go against the two big ones. Um, I guess you know, looking at it a minute more, maybe Latruska is good enough though to make Monomoy Girl have to be a little too aggressive, and, and maybe the race does fall into the lap of of Swiss Skydiver in that in that sense. I mean, I don't there, I couldn't find any prices that anybody's actually taking wagers on. But uh, just, you know, you know, let's just pretend the morning line is a market. And, and it's probably right that Monomoy Girl will be, you know, sh I would guess shorter than even. Uh, eat listed at even here. Swiss Skydiver 2-1, to one, probably shorter. But the relationship between Monomoy Girl and Swiss Skydiver might be right. So if I'm getting a better price on the one that I think it might set up better for, I guess you got to give me Swiss Skydiver in the spot, but I, it's not like I'll be rooting against uh, Monomoy Girl in any way, shape, or form. She's just so cool, and I've really enjoyed her run and her narrative, the kind of horse they could make a movie about. And uh, it's going to be fun to see how it plays out. It's a little, little bit late, 7.09 Eastern on Saturday for that one. This race surely has uh, Breeders' Cup implications. Yeah, I mean, th this is arguably – you know, you could potentially be looking at a a preview, and, and again, we're getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves, but uh, of the Breeders' Cup Distaff, you know, in early November, where it's not out of the realm of possibility that these two, you know, show off again against one another. I mean, we thought we were going to get it at Keeneland, and unfortunately, after a bad start from Swiss Skydiver, we really never got to see it materialize. Um, I, I still hold out hope. Win, lose, or draw for Monomoy Girl here on Saturday. With a good performance... I still hold out hope that we see her against the boys because I've, I've said it a few times on my pod that I I don't think there's anything else for her to prove against the girls. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just I know she can win the distaff. I know she can win anywhere between a mile and, and a mile and an eighth, two turn, one turn. Arguably, she's better at a one turn mile. And I know the met mile is sort of the easy, you know, low hanging fruit that that feels like the perfect scenario to run her against the boys. But I, I don't care where it is. I just want to see a, a chance to see her run against the boys. I want to see her do what Rachel Alexandra did, what Zenyatta did, what Beholder did. I want, I, cause I think she belongs in that same sort of category. Makes perfect sense. And at the beginning of the year, I, I still agree with you, but at the beginning of the year, I, I agreed even more at the beginning of the year. I was, I was, well, maybe I was too cynical at the beginning of the year when I, when I was thinking like, Oh, well, if you don't, if you don't do that, what's the point was a little bit my attitude. But now I see from this year's apple blossom that there still was a point, even if it is, only against her own sex because this type of generational showdown. I mean, this is like old school horse racing stuff to see how, you know, that next generation of superstar comes and shapes up against the, the previous generation of superstar. It's a clash of the Titans. And for folks, I'm glad you mentioned about the, the Breeders' Cup distaff. Uh, uh, that was not, I mean, Swiss Skydiver got badly hurt in that race. Not, not like in a scary way, but, um, that bad break and then getting getting her foot stepped on it, you know ended up running a pretty darn good race when you For consider sure. the fact that she lost a giant chunk of her hook just showed a lot of courage making the move in the middle of that race that she did after an injury had already happened she's tough as nails and uh you know you, you bake in this the, the expected improvement of a filly from three to four i mean she's just the, the more we talk about it, the more I look at it, the more I kind of like Swiss Skydiver in the spot. All the while, not minding at all if Monomoy Girl kicks sand in my face. I, I just went through and, and kind of real quick priced it out as far as what I would put these horses at. And again, keep in mind, a value line has got to be out of 100 points. You're not incorporating the, the morning line. And it's not meant to be a slight to any of the other folks that are involved in this race. It's just the reality of the situation. Um, I think the, the one, I wouldn't bet at 50 to one. 
Um, the two at seven to five. That's with Skydiver. Uh, Latruska six to one. Uh, the four and the five. I wouldn't touch either of them at less than you know forty or fifty to one. And Monomoy Girl, I'd have her at seven to five. So effectively, for me, it would come down to if I got seven to five on either of the two big girls, I would take it. If neither of them presented that, and you got six to one or better on a horse uh, like Latruska, I'd, I'd be interested. But for the most part, it would really just boil down to what, where does the market go? Who, who, who is the one that gets sort of le- not left behind, but doesn't get top billing, basically? That's such a great exercise that you just did. I don't want to gloss over it. And and at some point, I know you've talked about obviously the these ideas on on your show, but it, I feel like it should be a whole red board rewind at some point. You yeah. and uh, Spencer going over that process of how to really try to allocate, convert your opinion into numbers, basically that then dictate the price that each horse should be. Because of course, at the end of the day, as much as we pick horses. That's what we do on this show. That's what we, you know, certainly on our, our late week in the money players podcast is all about giving picks at the end of the day, that that's just part of it. And, and can almost be misleading because to be successful, you've you got to be playing prices, not horses. Let's take another quick look at uh, some folks who've chimed in and then we can, um, I'll, I'll get a sense of these post times and see if we can do these races, uh, before each one, or if we have to do a couple in a row before a race at one point. But, uh, Okay, we've got uh, Michael. Uh, oh, now I don't want to butcher the pr- butcher it when you did the good pronunciation. <laughs> it's it's Domabil, right? That's what I went with. Yeah. Okay, so that's right. And then we've got James mentioning extravagant kid winning the Alcaz Sprint um, and asking when is the first big American turf sprint uh, Derby Derby weekend? Uh, if it's not Derby week, I mean, I guess it depends. If you if you call the Churchill Downs a big one, I think the 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 big big one I, I would assume would be the Jiper. Um great that'll one. be on the Belmont Stakes undercard. That's a great one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think sort of the I would call it the unofficial kickoff of the turf sprint season would probably be the Churchill Downs on the Derby undercard. <laughs> well, the season all in start again. It was the funniest. What's what what is that a reference to? Will the season all in start again? Is that a show that I don't know? <laughs> all in, I'm not uh, familiar with. You're going to have to clue us in on that one there uh, to let us know. We have a question about handicapping the Kentucky Derby and how much importance we give to the last three-eighths times. That's a good question. Um, I would say that I'm not too worried about the raw times of the last three-eighths, but I do always like to look at um, late pace and closing I mean, sometimes I will boil it down to just closing sectionals and look at those numbers. It just, like everything else, it has to be viewed in context. If it was a super hot pace up front um, and a horse didn't do much running up front and then is able just to sort of coast home and do those last three A's quickly under pressure, that's not as impressive to me as a horse that's been running the whole way and can still stay on with impressive late closing sectionals. Is that something that you look at and factor into your your, uh, handicapping that? No, I like the way you laid it out. It's it's all in context because I, I, I do look at it a little bit from a, a fractional standpoint. And I've always used sort of the rule of thumb, especially for the Derby, the final quarter mile. If you can get it sub 26 seconds, I think you're actually finishing with something given the length of the race and, and the other factors that are involved. But to your point, you can finish in 25 and four or 26, but if you're starting 25 lengths out of it, it doesn't matter. You're, you're just, you're not going to have any chance. If you're a horse though, that either is forwardly placed or has a little bit of tactical speed and you're finishing in 25 and four or 26 flat, then you know what? I, I'm certainly going to look at you and, and consider maybe reconsider the overall sort of scope of things and say, you know what, you either ran better or worse than I thought you were going to. I know Chris Larmy does a, a, a neat little exercise as far as, um, projecting out final times at a mile and a quarter. And I know he's tweeted it in the past. Um, I would encourage folks to go in and, and search that out because because Chris is as sharp as they come. But um, yeah, so I, I do look at, at late numbers, especially for the Derby. But uh, to your point, it's 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 all, you got to contextualize it somehow. And, and I think a lot of it is just, you got to put into perspective where they're starting from. You can find a lot of signal in those, in the idea of late pace. And it's not as obvious as early pace that's for sure chris larmy you can find him at 
Derby1592. You can listen to him on his own Sport of Kings podcast that he does with Scott Carson. I second that idea. Very, very sharp dude. We'll see if he shows us up once again this year, Matt, in our <laughs> Derby draft. One year he picked out of the leftovers of our 20-runner Derby draft and finished with it with a tie for first. So uh, that's that's all the endorsement you need for him. Let's talk quickly about this sixth race at Gulfstream, though, Matt. We're on the turf, about seven and a half furlongs. Uh, starter allowance company i had mentioned my idea before zap daddy uh, i felt like could be a little bit interesting too close last time and good runs closing two and three back at a at a similar level um that's one i definitely want in here i thought that the two and the nine seemed obvious abiding star and midday image um but i, I felt like there could be a meltdown and that zap daddy if held up this time, unlike the last day, it could end up with an advantage. My double blew up in the last race uh, with the big long shot Carrick getting the job done. So I'm just going to bet to win. I, I didn't have anything creative in here. I, I thought speed played, and I agree with you. It's going to be on the swifter side because I just think that's what these horses do. Abiding star specifically, his game is speed. He wants to go fast. I'm hopeful there's a scenario, slight turn back in distance to seven and a half here from the eight and a half most recently. If Paco can just, as opposed to going breakneck speed early on, if we can just throttle back a hair, I think that might be enough to turn the tables. Now, having said that, I don't think there's a giant difference between the two and the nine. I mean, the nine defeated the two heads up in the most recent run. And again, this goes back to the whole value piece of things. I don't know what the double will pays look like. But if you're telling me I can take the nine, the horse that defeated the two in the most recent run, and I'm going to get twice the price, while I think the two is going to win, I'd be betting a nine in here, simply from a percentage or a probability standpoint. It makes perfect sense. That's, that's how it's done. Now, we, we need to – one thing you have to do is be a little careful um, in these situations because of the fact that these odds can continue to change. For sure. I, and you might end up getting chiseled out of that edge. You're not locking in those prices – uh, looking into the the will pays one very effective way to get a pretty good idea of, of how that might turn out. Uh, I'm hoping there's, still, there's, a, there's a pretty uh, legitimate discrepancy. I, I don't know that it's going to change too much from this two to one and three to one. Okay, two to one and three to one. You will be going under those circumstances with the nine. I'm taking the five. Let's see. Let's see what happens here in this the, the seven and a half uh, turf race at uh, at Gulfstream Park. Hopefully we can uh, we get some good trips and, and, and get on the board here. I was going to say, and, and again, it, there, there is something to the, the idea of, you know, there's versatile, well, uh, two and five to two. Okay, so this one did come down a hair. But, you know, there's something to the idea of, you know, a horse like a biting star. Yeah, you know, sometimes he does cook his own goose, but you got to go. He's a one-way speed. He, he reminds me a little bit of heart to heart, not nearly as talented, but you, you had one way to go and you knew when they were in the race, there was going to be some pace. So I think that at least opens up opportunities if you're not sold on their chances to take someone from off of it. That idea of trying to find races where you have, uh, typically in these days, you'd almost need three of them of those need the lead types. But sometimes, sometimes you can just make a guess about a younger horse or uh, an inexperienced horse that's only run that good race on the lead and put them into that category before it becomes. PTF, did the uh, saddle slip on this horse? I can't. That goes way up on his neck. Yeah, that is weird. I don't know what's going on. We're going to see what happens when they when they turn in here. I didn't mean to cut you off. It was just he was riding no, very very awkward. I saw I saw what you meant. I I think he he look at all he's looking around. He's looking around more than more, more than, than usual. usual. <laughs> um, but now he I I don't know what's going on because he seems he seems to be okay at this point. Yeah, um, he's riding. Yeah. So, so yeah, you wouldn't be able to do that if the saddle had, had truly slipped. I think it was just an it was an unusual. Um, he looked unusual, but yeah, he got the job done. A little awkward, a little awkward. But yeah, that that idea of of to design races it can be very frustrating when you when you guess wrong. But I think you find a lot of like four to one shot can beat by making guesses about horses that need that need that you think need the lead aren't going to get it um, that's one of the things i've had the most success with in the last my last little bit of handicapping is just trying to use the idea of designing races and you know betting against the third best speed horse that's not going to trip out 
you know, and, and the same with closers too, you know, sort of a plotty closer and there's better closers. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a way that I think a lot of people get and you know, computers looking at a race, they're so focused just on the, on the raw numbers. They're not necessarily thinking about those internal pace dynamics. I see we have one minute here at, uh, at Keeneland. I'm not going to get caught out again, Matt. I'll ask you what you think of this one. We've got um, uh, Maiden 50s going a mile and a 16th on the dirt. Uh, what do you like in here? Not, not a brilliant opinion. Joe Sharp's barn is really, really rolling right now. I'm going to go with the five in here. First off, the claim sometimes always uh, stretches out in distance, has Luis Saez. I expect to be forward, if not outright, on the lead, going from six to a, a mile and a 16th here. Maiden claimers doesn't really bother me. I'll take my shot. Same horse, and I, I think that, that was a pretty strong rail that day of the debut with the other barn and was wide. So I think is maybe even a little bit better than looks. Uh, odds of two to one are still pretty good to me. I, I make this horse more like an eight to five shot. Who knows? Maybe it'll end up going off at that number. But uh, number five, sometimes awful, will hopefully be brilliant for us. Uh, third, t- third race, we've landed on the same horse. One of them's got to do well, don't they? Did you have uh, an alternative? The only other one that was mildly intriguing to me was French Toast, who's taken quite a bit of money in here for Rapoli and Maker. I figured, I thought that debut was, let's call it inoffensive. The speed and fade. <laughs> I think we can move forward second out. You can make, I can definitely see the story on that one. It was going to be all about the five for me here from a wagering point of view, but that that's okay. a very logical alternative. Uh, we break, go right to the, don't even think about it, just go. <laughs> when you when you catch a flyer like that just go and he's trying to pump a little bit they must be going a decent clip though because we can't get any separation can't even no. make the front yeah he's gonna be hopefully in a good spot he flops outside here and gets a nice stalking spot um outside the seven i um, mean horse appears to be running we'll see what the clock tells us in a minute is this uh, is the seven a major uh, contender? Yeah, one of the favorites in here. The, the top three choices are one, two, three right now. And, and honestly, that opening quarter not nearly as fast as I thought it was. Now again, I don't I don't know what the run up situation is here, but um, you know, uh, twenty four seconds for the opening quarter. There's there's no reason that the top three shouldn't shouldn't perform unless they just aren't that good. It could be a merry go round. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens here as the as they get underway. But it does have that does have that kind of feel to it. The horses coming from the back are going to have their going to definitely have their work to do in terms of the way this is playing out, not just pace wise, but also having to go having to make the the move wide around. Um, I need to hear Kurt Pecker into the short stretch. <laughs> Can we have Craig turn it up only at least only when he says that? But I mean, the five, you know, no excuse from here. If, if no. we hopefully we can get it done. Uh, the 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 leader might be going. A little bit better. I don't know. I think but we're pick, I think we're picking up. All right. Let's see if we can. Let's see if we can get one in the win column here. Yeah, I think. I think we're picking up now. It's just a matter of change over to the right lead. Yep, there you change go. and finish. Change and finish. And up. Oh, but your two is uh, is maker going to make us earn from. it. And then the thing on the outside is not without some chance to get involved. Looks like. Uh, looks like the alternative. Looks like it's going to come two five here. Two okay. five seven. So you know, uh, you were you were right about the right about the merry-go-round, just in the in the wrong order for yeah. for us. You were you were smarter than me. You were more worried about the winner than I was. Who, who looked all no, right? No, there. no excuse either. I mean, I, I thought all things considered, you know, what else? Unless you're the one that's actually cutting out the fractions. In a weird way, I could say the most disappointing was the seven of them all because you were able to clear off to the front and set rather tepid fractions. But um, yeah, a little I'm a little bit disappointed with that performance. I would have would have thought the five would have got it done. Not not one that I'm eager to bet back. The no. winner the winner seemed much winner seemed much the best. You know, Agreed. got it done without a particular setup. Um, the, the top two felt felt like they had easier trips and still still got the job done. And, and one that maybe can be maybe can be a, a little progressive for those uh, for those connections who certainly no strangers to winning races. We've got two minutes at a, a sloppy sealed and extremely rainy. Aqueduct. I was hoping we'd be the winning tonic for the Mets Thursday day game again uh, this week, like we were with that. I don't know if you saw the play at the end. The cheapest win in, in the history of of the franchise with the uh, was it Conforto yeah. got hit by the pitch for the walk off and walk and it was a strike. <laughs> it was ridiculous. But by, hey, by the by the way, a, a miracle. We talked about the the Red Sox and Mets fans a week ago, and I said you you have played. 
quite literally like half a percent and 2.4 percent of your season and since then the Red Sox haven't lost and the Mets have you know again they're, they're, the Mets are putting things together I just everyone take a deep breath take a deep breath we'll be okay you can hear Sam the bugler or whoever is playing it and it's you know I just I thought that was hysterical people are losing their minds especially up my neck of the woods oh I, I and all they and all they've done is gone off and, and won nine in a row yeah, they haven't lost at all. Then the Mets on the verge of uh, sweeping the hated Phillies. I'll just yeah. go ahead and say it. One minute at Aqueduct, it'll probably be a little bit longer than that. So maybe we can quickly talk about this race and then get to some more viewer contents, uh, contents, comments. <laughs> and we encourage folks to, to let us know where you're watching for. Let us know what your most meaningful gambling win was. What do you like here in the sixth race at Aqueduct here? Seven furlongs, optional claimers, uh, not winners of two lifetime. I like Bankston quite a bit, the number five in here. Now, the, the wet track, a little bit of an unknown. Gets a hiking class. Most recently came through the state bred N1X. Now we go up to the N2X level for the first time. Um, but I, based on that most recent run, horse is a little green coming off the far turn, but once angled out into the clear, really finished with some gusto. Second place finisher came back, earned a 70 by your next out. Fifth place finisher was the next out winner with a 67. So I have reason to believe that 74 buyer is – pretty close maybe a hair on the light side but we're splitting hairs at that point i think banks thing has the ability to be involved early or sit just off of it and um the price is right uh i'm looking at the double will pays this horse might come down a little bit the 10 for whatever reason is dead on the board based on the double will pays uh six to one right now is the first choice in the will pay for the double so maybe you'll get a little bit of movement here with some of these odds but uh banks thing for me the five I, I absolutely get it, and you could well be right. I will. Uh, the only thing I'll point out is that was during that awesome rail period at Aqueduct. Mm -hmm. So I was just, I was a little skeptical based on that. But she did come off the rail and uh, it, 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 for the run. So, and you make a good point about the form of the race. So, definitely a contender. I like the idea of using your bank sting with my, my Roxy girl, who I think is going to get the right kind of trip in this spot. And uh, it just looks to me like uh, she's probably laid out for a big effort. I think the seven to two is fair on her. You surprised at all that the one forever change is catching in here? Yeah, a, a little bit. And uh, this is another one in here for Charlie Baker. I mean, you've got the other one. I, and, I, you know, I do look at the fact that this horse has won at this level in the past. And I say that's a feather in her cap. But at the same time, the recent form has been really bad, really bad. And it, it makes me look twice at the at the tote and say, did I miss something? Because, yes, you have proven yourself at this level. But, you know, at the same time, you, you're not coming into this in, in, in great shape as far as your running lines are concerned. So I, I wasn't sold on her chances. But looking at the tote makes me think twice. Yeah, I'm I'm a little uh, befuddled. It's not like this is a big uh, not like this is a big class drop. It's not like. This is going to be the world's greatest trip, and it's not. Um, it, it's not like she's in form. So this this could be a a they knew situation. We'll, yeah. we'll we'll find out. But I feel like like eight to one. That to me was a bit more where this one where this one would sit. But as we've talked about many times, there could be signal in the uh, in these tote um, steam horses as well. Let's see what else we have. We got a question. Your background, Matt, apparently some uh, some golf clubs. You planning on going out and hitting the links later? Yeah, so this is uh, these are a number of my putters. Now, the, the thing with me is um, putting. I, uh, I don't want to say I struggle with, but I, I fall in and out of love with putters very, very quickly. And when one treats me well, I keep it in the bag. And when one doesn't, gone. Uh, just yesterday, actually, I got rid of a very expensive putter. I traded it in and got a different one. I got one of the new... One of the new old Odyssey two balls for anybody that is a, a proper golfer that, that plays a lot and knows what I'm talking about. It's I, I just like the weight of it, and I'm, I'm going to be very curious. The weather in uh, my neck of the woods tomorrow is miserable. Uh, it's supposed to feel like 21 degrees, so I won't be playing tomorrow. What? Uh, yeah, 21. Yeah, awesome. That's uh, not a typo? No, no, 2-1. Two, two, uh, 51. I'll give you 51. 2-1 uh, <laughs> in rain for us tomorrow, so – that's a hard pass, but I'm supposed to get back out there at some point on Saturday, and uh, I'll see how it goes. But, yes, this is my putting green with some of my backup putters. We'll do some shouting out here to Lon, uh, to Tom once again, to Sal, who's back with us. 
Oh, he was shouting out the no hitter from from last night. That was uh, that was exciting stuff. Nearly a perfect game. How, yeah, well. how about a way to lose the perfect game? <laughs> Flip him on the toe. Better that than than one of your fielders making an error, I suppose, and creating <laughs> or, all kinds or, of uh, vibes. Who was it? Was it Jim Joyce? Oh, who blew, who blew the call with uh, Galarraga all those years ago? Yeah, that was bad. Felt bad for the guy. Yeah, that was bad for everybody involved. Yeah, bad. Yeah, exactly feel cruddy a uh, question about if paco lopez had derby man i'll have to look i'll have to look that up i don't always i think jockey assignments are important but i don't always keep them in my head but uh, a quick little jaunt on the internet should probably get that one um straightened out for us um and they're off off, off the top of my head i don't i don't think he does but again that, that can change i mean we're seeing mounts picked up and, and moved left and right recently so yeah, he is not the he is not the regular rider of any of the ones that are that are on the list there. And uh, my Roxy go right out to the lead. I thought my I thought might try to sit, but I don't I, I don't mind that. You're not going to hear me you're not going to hear me complaining. Um, looks like a decent um, decent trips for Bank Sting and Forever Change, the other horses we we spoke about as well. You happy enough with where you are here? Yeah, I mean, I think they're going a little bit quick. Um, but at the same time, I, I think this is a perfectly fine position. And if she's as good as I think she is, then she shouldn't have any excuse. Was secret love. Is that, uh, let's see. That is, who is that on the outside? Now I looked away for a second. Yeah, and I secret I love is trying to loop up on the outside beneath the rad. Okay. Um, I'm optimistic with banks thing because she really runs when she hits the straight. So, no. you know, I'll be, I would like to think if she's, again, what I think she is, she should be able to put this field away, but she looks like she's struggling a little bit. Well, has a chance. It's coming apart a little bit um, with the big run. That Dig is the, the favorite on yeah, the outside, ready. but you're finding more, Matt. I think you might be just okay here. Looks like we're going to have it come five, seven, and 10. Very good pick. I'll tell you what, I, I think she's a decent little horse. I, I'm not saying she's going to be a graded stakes winner at Saratoga, but I, I I think she's she's okay. This is only her fourth lifetime start. I still think this was the most professional I think she's been, and it's not that she's been unprofessional, but she's had a little she's been a little quirky as far as rounding the turn is concerned. And she really seems to level off when she hits the lane and really, really kicks on. So, you know, I would I would hope that you move up into sort of the low mid eighty range with a race like this. She's proven on a wet track now and and maybe some of these New York Red Stakes races uh, have her name on it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. I definitely underrated. It was very professional. And I like the fact that she was able to find that under gear, that extra gear when briefly there under pressure, um, as we saw on the replay. I pulled it out. Actually ended up getting bit down to favoritism, but uh, but a nice a nice favorite, a three to yeah. one uh, score there for, for Bank Sting at Aqueduct. So we are six out of seven races in the books. We will give you a leaderboard update, and that once we this one goes official, and then we'll have a few more minutes to to chat and interact with some listeners. Let us know if anybody wants to tell us about uh, a meaningful gambling score they had. We'd love to see that. We'll we'll say hi back to uh, Nick. Compliments the shows, and we appreciate that very much. If you like our act, you can see a lot more of it on iTunes. If you subscribe to the In the Money Media feed. You'll get all the podcasts on the network, including the Matt Bernier show, which is fantastic, and uh, the stuff that JK and I do as well. Mike Baychock says hello, and we'll say we'll say hi back to him. He, he was up there. Um, the champ. The, the, that's right, the million dollar man. Um, he he was his name. He had some points before. We'll see if he can get himself up into the mix. Just to remind folks what we're doing here, we're going to have the top. Uh, is it going to be the top twenty eight today? Who top 20. are who are going to be advancing into the the weekend. Which day? We'll, we'll look when we see which day's Saturday. qualifier it's for. <clears throat> Saturday. It's for Saturday's Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge qualifier. And then folks are playing along for tour points. It was very exciting. We had our first tour leaderboard announced last week. This one will be the first one that's not just the, the, first, the 10 names from the first contest, but I'll see if I recognize anybody. We'll see who's going to be the early leader on the Horse Players Happy Hour Tour. At the end of the contest, the person with the best score on the tour overall will win a Breeders' Cup betting challenge seat. And then we've all playoff system where folks with high tour scores and anybody who finishes in the top two are going to play in the Super Bowl tournament the last few weeks. The last few weeks of Horse Player Happy Hour, we're going to follow 80 players 
They're going to cut to 40 one week to one week. Then 40 the next week will end up being 20, 20 to 10. 10 will compete at the final table. And we'll still have qualifying action going on uh, concurrent with that. So folks will have a reason to, to continue to play as we get closer to the Breeders' Cup betting challenge. For those who don't know, um, pretty much the pinnacle in horse racing contests. No offense to our friends at the at the NHC, which is a, a great tournament in its own right, but $10,000 buy-in on the best race meeting of the year, the Breeders' Cup. Why not try to win your way in and have that money to fire away, and then you have a chance to participate in the massive prize pool that day as well. You can buy your way in, but why not try to win your way in, and why not win your way in while you're helping a charity? That's what you can do. Um, in this spot. You, you did such a great job last time, Matt. I'll let you uh, take us through the leaderboard. <laughs> let me pull it up so I can zoom in so I don't screw up anybody's name here, or I can do my best anyway. Uh, Eric Kurzal, the leader right now, 82-80. Michael Domabil in second at 69-20. Peter Dressen's in third at 58-20. We have a three-way tie for fourth. Stephen Walsh, Ernest A. Jr., and Thomas Nanny. We go into seventh with Bob Schreider at 48-20. Eighth is Jason Osterman at 45.60. Ninth is Keith Simon at 42.40. And Peter Visco, who's been a guest on uh, my pod a few times, he's in 10th right now at 42.20. Then we have a number of folks, let's say between 11 and, holy smokes, uh, 11 and all the way down to like 40 are separated by about 12 bucks. There, there is There are a few names in there that we are all familiar with. Alexis Zepp's name is in there. Uh, Michael Baychock, we, we've chatted about. Basil DeVito's in there. The one name that my eyes immediately went to, uh, number 19 right now, Truls Engerbretson, oh, who was the winner name. last week. Yep. So, you know, while we'll find out. We still have a race to go, and I'd have to take a look and see where what the, the price is on the five here. Three to one, so I don't know if that'll – quite be enough but it's not out of the realm of possibility that trolls can get up into the top 10 and accumulate some more points as far as the regular season is concerned trolls is on the five here in this last race so i mean seven to one that's that's significant that's going to be you know 21 ish points should the five win that would be 59 that would that would that would definitely be in in tour position for Truels. So that's an early story to follow and a great example of how much fun these broadcasts are going to be to come up with little uh, little nuggets like that along the way. I, I was accused, this isn't in the public comments, but I did get a comment. I was accused of a major host fail last week by, by a listener who said, why in the world didn't you shout out the fact that in the money media's own business manager, Drew Coatney, was the bubble boy last week, just missing the opportunity to uh, to qualify for the for the weekend Breeders' Cup betting challenge game, and I will admit that was hashtag host fail. And uh, I I feel bad, Drew. I hopefully I didn't see your name up there, but hopefully you're playing again, and we'll have a little bit better luck. Obviously, as an in the money media guy, not eligible for the the tour piece of things, but uh, he is certainly eligible to to go ahead and play in the qualifier. There he is, he's number thirty nine. Yeah, yeah he's, he's there. He's is he drawing? But is he drawing live? What does he have here? He's He's got the one. He's got a three to one shot. So you're looking at nine or ten bucks. Um, he's, got, he's, yeah. got a five to, he's got a five to one shot. Oh, he's got a five to one shot. I picked. Uh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. He's he's drawn live. Yeah, yeah, he's only 34 right now. No, no. Uh, yeah, 34 is the cut line. So so yeah. Hopefully, okay. Drew will not be the bubble boy for the second uh, the second week in a row. We've got a comment here. We've got a got a flash up on screen. This is a this is a good one from Curtis Watson who tells us he's playing in his first horse player. Happy hour contest. He definitely likes it. We'll be playing again. Nice twist on contest play. Also likes the, the pod video, et cetera, going on during the contest. Says he's not getting much done at work. <laughs> That's our goal. Not, not exactly, but kind of. Yeah, we're, we're, we're very happy to give people that excuse to, to goof off and, and join us. So Don't bill us if you get fired. <laughs> That's right. Again, no no divorce advice, no <laughs> employment uh, adjudication. You're on your own with that. Um, we've got Brian Shields chiming in that it was the 2019 Belmont Stakes um, was the, the late pick four. Wow, nice hit there, um, Sir Winston. That was a that was a bloody result for me. But Brian, I was going to say that that may be the opposite for me. I don't really remember like bad beats and, and sort of poor losses, things like that. I just try to put it, you know, whatever. Turn the page. That day, I was doing a seminar at Mohegan Sun. 
with my buddy Mike Matnansky from up here at WEI in Boston. Sure, of course. And I was alive in the pick five to Tacitus and War of Will. And I think it was like, I could be wrong, but I want to say it was like for five grand and like eight or nine grand. And I, going into the race, I said, it's, it's these two. There's, I mean, there's no one else in the race that I'm interested in. And Mike loved Sir Winston. And I said, he just doesn't have the running style. He's going to come from too far out of it. And we're watching the, 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 the race. And I'm going, I can't tell you what I say right now because we'll get in trouble for it. But I was, I was swearing, <laughs> swearing under my breath as I'm watching on the screen. Going unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable. Left them off. I think my tickets all told were like ninety six or a hundred dollars, and I I didn't back anybody up because I didn't oh. like anybody else. That's frustrating. And it was it wasn't it a golden rail? Wasn't that part of the success? It was like a yeah. really good rod and a good rail, and he just to sort of rode that. that that's that's and my Tacitus, memory. Tacitus was five wide, I think. Yes. Oh God, Ta that was one of the trip. That was one of the trips that made Tacitus Tacitus. You're correct. <laughs> <laughs> Oakley Jeter, uh, I just say I have a charity function going on. More understanding uh, the bosses of that than, than drinking and gambling. Very, very shrewd move there. Thanks. This is Trish, Thank another, another guest of uh, the pod. Oh, fantastic. That's great. She, she picked up uh, playing the horses, not to you know spoil too, too much, but she picked up playing the horses during the pandemic. Oh, wow. Good, good or, hobby. Or, we were the only game in town. It was like the old days for a minute there. We were the only game in town again. Well, that's great yeah. to great to have you. Great to have all the new people. Great to see uh, Craig flashed it up on screen before, but I didn't I didn't get to it. Eric Kurzal, our our leader, um, complimenting the show and uh, looking to make it to the finals. A top two finish. We'll do that for Eric. Uh, you know, look at looking good. It's horse racing. Anything can happen. But uh, fingers crossed as far as that goes. Maybe we should talk about this race. And, uh, and and then we'll, we'll get back and maybe we can look at some implications on the leaderboard of uh, who will who will win with with what result, that kind of thing. I can't find my notes on Gulfstream's uh, seventh race, Matt, so I'm going to let you lead this one off. Uh, we have Keeneland seven coming up here, uh, five and a half on the turf. That's and why I couldn't find it, you see. that It, it all makes sense now. I do good, have that one, but you go ahead. Good news for Eric Kurzal, and I don't, uh, you know, I'm – don't blame me if something crazy happens. But you have enough of a lead, I think, over third. You're at what, roughly, if I'm doing my math right, I don't know, almost, what, $20, $24 roughly, call it. This race happens to be so wide open that there aren't giant prices. Right. You have two horses who are double digits, and Eric has one of them covered. So he doesn't have to worry about that horse. He has to worry about Smart Remark, who happens to be the horse that I picked. We'll get into that in a bit. But um, outside of that, Guildsman probably makes things a little bit tight. And I think Guildsman does have a puncher's chance if the pace materializes. But again, going back to sort of the game theory, and this is a piece, I know we've talked about it with Jonathan in the past. You know, I'm of the opinion of trying to, especially in these pick and prays, plotting accordingly where I can get to that last race. And maybe I end up picking a horse who ends up being a price that I actually think has a, has a chance for two reasons. If I'm behind playing catch up, maybe I at least have something that I can, you know, a last ditch effort. But also if I'm in a position like Eric is now I've effectively taken out one of the horses that, that could have beaten me had I had the favorite in here. I do understand and respect the idea of needing to take money when you can get it. And if you think there's just a lock in there, I, I understand but I, I tend to try to almost work backwards and say, if I can find a, a middling price or some sort of price that I like in that last leg, it kind of serves two purposes for me. So if I'm in position, I wipe out anybody that can come and leapfrog me. But also if I am behind, maybe there's a chance that if I catch lightning in a bottle, I can, I can jump over some folks. I've heard a lot of contest players espouse that. On the math, I think it, it's more of an like, it depends – but sure. I feel like, but sometimes the thing is though, it's not always just about making the right decisions. And then if you make the right decision, you're always, you know, if you make the mathematically correct decision, that, that doesn't necessarily matter. At the end of the day, what matters is how you feel about the decisions you make. And I think you're going to feel pretty darn good 
more often than not in the going into the last race, unless it's just a favorite that you love that you wish you had, and you'll know right. that beforehand. But if you're like sort of torn, as much as in general in contests, you want to lean towards the longer of the two prices you're thinking about. I feel like at the end of these pick and pray contests where all the picks have to be in before the first race, that's even more true. And yeah, so I think you're, and I think you're right that um, our leader is in is in pretty darn good shape. The there's probably just the two horses to worry about. So a lot a lot running for for Eric in terms of making the the the, the ability to get into those finals. Let's give our thoughts on this race quickly, and then and then who knows? Maybe we'll um we'll hear a little bit more from folks watching. We'll share a few more of your comments in terms of your most memorable gambling scores. I think we know Mike Baychocks. I don't think we need we don't need him <laughs> we don't need him to tell us about the 2012 NHC. Though I will encourage folks to go back in the archive of the In the Money network uh, on inthemoneypodcast.com or through the In the Money media uh, feed on iTunes um, to to find his recent interview with Maggie Wolfendale. It was a particularly good telling of that whole story. And the, the aft, and its aftermath. I won't give any spoilers, but I highly recommend if you're looking for a podcast, Mike Baychuk on Off Track with Maggie Wolfendale. Uh, truly fantastic. But now we, we ask you the most important question of all, Matt. Who's going to win this race at Keeneland to uh, end this week's Horse Player Happy Hour? A t- tough call. Um, if you have a, a super strong opinion in here, I, I would default to you. I look at this race and say I can see any one of the eight that are lined up winning. I really can. I, I think it's that wide open. Um, I ended up in a little contest that I'm in. I'm trying to feed into some of these other weekend contests. I went with Smart Remark, and it's simply an insanity play because I've backed this horse a million times. <laughs> I think this horse has ability for whatever reason. He just doesn't always put it together, and, and maybe he won't do it again here. But I knew he'd be a, a giant price, and it would be my luck that this would be the time that he ends up firing and he you know pays 40-some dollars. But I, in all honesty, you could really just rip through this field one through eight and make legitimate arguments, I think, for for just about every one of them. Uh, the other horse that I thought made some sense and a horse that I've had some success with, maybe pace compromise would be the seven guildsmen. Um, the, the form at the end of 20 and at the beginning of 19, yeah, or excuse me, at the beginning of 21, not great. I'll admit that. But I think the best races for this one are every bit as good, if not better than anyone else in this race. And I know he may be a little light on figs, but I, I think Guildsman can run a little bit. It just really boils down to pace. And, and to be honest, I, I'm not entirely clear on what the pace situation looks like in this race. It's, it doesn't look like there's a ton of it. Uh, I would imagine Maven will tear off from there. Uh, maybe Edgemont Road will try that. But yeah, the bad. I guess that you're you're sort of giving the bad news for uh, for folks at the you know clinging to spots right now that. Um, that you've that you've given cases for a couple of horses that really could shake things up in the in the four and the seven. Um, I, I'm just going to think that Maven, who's done this before, coming back off a long layoff at Keeneland with the Ward Barn flying now, um, you might just be the best speed. First time gelding. Seven to two feels okay to me. I'm going to bet Maven. I would – Encourage folks too, and this is just again sort of a, a longer, a bigger picture view of things. There was a race earlier today; it was a baby race, and that's not even really the important piece. Ward ended up winning it. He had two that were entered, and I don't know what the the scenario was with the other one, but they were not common ownership. The other one was scratched, and you had two different jockeys named, so it wasn't a matter of you know one is definitely going to go. One horse scratched, the other one ran, the other one ran off the screen. It's that old adage, and I think there is truth to it. Why run two when one will do? <laughs> you don't need to burn a bullet when you've got one that you know is going to get the job done. I, I'm not telling you that you're going to end up getting giant prices on these horses. I think that one paid four bucks. But if you're playing in a contest or you're playing in, you know, you got to pick five you're putting together. I always think that is something to keep an eye on. If you've got a trainer with multiple runners in there, and for one reason or another, the other horse is withdrawn, look a lot harder. At the very least, take a second glance at the one that stayed in the body. 
That's it's an excellent point. I mean, sometimes you will see them, you know, deliberately run too with team tactics, but especially with maidens, yeah. I think that's a very, very significant angle. And yeah, Coffee Maker got the job done. Was a short price, but you know, if you were willing to lean into Coffee Maker and fade the very well regarded John Hancock runner Bodie by you on the outside, you could have uh, you, you would pick up some equity in a pick five sequence, for example. I. I got bit there. I went the other direction. I, I thought Bodie by you looked like Me too. the goods. Yeah, and it, <laughs> it did not work out. It did not work out that Another time. thing that I'm always guilty of, I'm, I'm always going to give extra credit to the horses who have started, actually, in the afternoon. So, yeah. so the, you know, the outside runner already had a start under his belt, and, and it's or her belt, and it still didn't make a difference. The, the ward horse ran off the screen. Yeah, I think that, that coffee maker was meant to be good and showed it in that spot interesting to see if she becomes uh if she becomes one of the one of the potential asket runners um so i was gonna i was gonna ask you that with your experience in in working over there and and spending time over there do do you know i I genuinely have no idea what the methodology is for which of the two-year-olds from ward's barn are are being pointed over there because they all start on the dirt like what is the is there a rhyme or reason to who goes Sometimes you can't – I'm sure there is. I'm just not trying to know what it is because you can't okay. always tell from the pedigree. Sometimes it's obvious from the pedigree, you know, Campanelle or whatever. But, you know, looking at this one, Jimmy Creed out of a Montbrook mare, um, just doing the cursory time form U.S. look, um, she is supposed to be better on turf than on dirt. So, And I just know – I know there was a lot of chatter about her, so – I, I think she feels like one of the ones and I know the ones early, the ones, the recent ones have supposed to have been better than the ones that came out the first weekend, um, you know, which the, they're running. Uh, that was the story going in, but that's also certainly what they're, what their running lines tell you. And it didn't prevent by the way, those early ones from getting bet off the board as well. Right. right. But I plan on doing a show. We've actually got a new podcast coming out. It's sort of a, I don't know what it is, but our, <laughs> our buddy Sean Tugel, uh, mm-hmm. who's now at Gainsway Farm, we used to do the In the Ring show with that Acacia is doing a fantastic job with on the network. Uh, Sean and I are going to do a series of, of shows called Baby Talk this year, where we analyze, some of them are going to be looking ahead at upcoming hot two-year-old races. We sort of decided for the first one, we want to do a roundup of the two-year-old races at Keeneland. So hopefully for that show, one of us will, will do the due diligence and we can start highlighting some of these Wesley two-year-olds um, and potentially other two-year-olds that might be running at Royal Ascot. Um, it takes place, for those that don't know, about the middle of June after Belmont. We get the, the this and like one like half deep breath and then we go right into... Uh, into Royal Ascot. Got a couple of other uh, comments here. John Gasper, who gave us such great thoughts on tournament play last year, mentions having a great day using Empire Maker in the Belmont. He also mentioned Silver Charms Derby. Silver Charms Derby, as much as, almost as much as any race, probably for me, if I go back to the races that got me into racing, I'd have to go editor's notes Belmont first, because that was really like the day that got the hook in. But Interestingly, that Silver Charm, that 97 Derby, to this day, I probably spent more time handicapping that race than any other race I've ever looked at. And it was just one of those magical, it runs just like you thought it was going to run. And, uh, and and it was a, a huge, a huge win emotionally for me as well. And then Empire Maker, that makes a ton of sense. You know, there was so much sentiment behind Funny Side who was, you know, kind of over the top at that point. And, and meanwhile, here's Empire Maker, who was, uh, you know, bet a big favoritism over him in the Derby, coming back uh, loaded for Bear. A good opportunity for Wise Guys. I wanted Funny Side desperately as a fan, but that was the biggest win bet I've made in my life up to that point <laughs> on Empire Maker. Um, Sean Hickey's looking for a nice tip today. We, we get Matt just gave you a nice winner and, and he just gave you a uh, a 20 to one shot in this race. Mine is less sexy at, at the five to two with Maven. We'll see what uh, what ends up happening here in our uh, anchor leg of this second horse players happy hour tour event when they pop the gates in the minute. I'm hoping for good things from Maven. Matt's at the higher end of the price spectrum. Tournament points on the line here. Let's see what happens. Maven popping right out of there in that manner of a Wesley Ward horse. 
and uh, length and a half, two lengths clear before um, you could blink your eye. Uh, I'm not sure. I love that little flag tail action he's doing, but I mean, he seems to be. He seems just, to, he's waving to everybody saying, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> let's hope, for my sake, let's hope that's what it is. But I, I, I he doesn't, I, it doesn't, it's, it's not the most comfortable um, looking posture, but I'm not sure if, if he's got, if he shows the best speed that he's shown in his career, you know, this graded stakes winner, group stakes winner at two, um, he might be waving goodbye. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't with, trade. Yeah, with with the way that he's being handled right now, anyway. I mean, somebody's going to have to pick him up here pretty quick. Yeah, he, the, the the two is coming with a with a big chance. Um, looks quite possible to pick up Maven, but Maven finding down there at the rail, and uh, hopefully, for my sake, is going to hang on. And it looks like he will. You, you can, it's an interesting horse. You can see you can see from the way he runs why maybe he he hasn't. You know, he runs by appointment only. He's 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 missed some time, um, but yeah. you, you can also see just the raw talent and flash that he that he brings to the party. Um, maybe getting the job done at, uh, at seven dollars. At least I didn't go over my seven picks on the show. I, I feel good about that, Matt. I think to your point, also you can understand or at least start to piece together why they they have gelded him. Um, you know, again, he, he's a son of American Pharaoh who is a a group stakes winner. You know, I mean, this is, it's not like we're dealing with a horse who has no credentials. And to your point, he's only run six times to date, now seven times today. He's a gelding as a four-year-old. I think there are some things going on here. So maybe you can just get longevity out of him knowing that, you know, who he maybe ends up being, and I, this is not a bad thing. Maybe he ends up being a horse like Bound for Nowhere, who is another ward sort of, uh, he's, he's more sprinter than Myler, but, you know, he can get out to that seven or eight furlong distance but he probably runs four times a year and it's simply because he's clearly got some, some ouchy pieces to him, but when he runs, he runs. And, and again, you, you smoke this one out. He's, he's got some credentials. He's got good speed. Um, when he gets to the front, he's hard to get by. Yeah. He's a good horse. And, and hopefully, I mean, heck he's another, he's another one very likely ask it bound. I would think um, if they think he's good enough, just because he was, he was meant to run there as a two year old and it got, it was like super boggy ground. I mean, the horse obviously acts on good ground, but it was boggy, and they pulled him out and they went for the run in in Shanty instead before the uh, the array of injuries began. Let's look at what this is going to mean. We can we we can tell you some things. Our top two are not going to be changing on the on the leaderboard. There, I don't think there's any way Stephen Walsh, the top player to have Maven, is going to be able to uh, to to get up in there and break the the hold that Eric Kurzal and Mike Domabil have. Uh, they will be our third and fourth players, um, unless I'm missing something, to qualify for our playoffs at the end of the year. Um, it doesn't. I'm not sure how much movement we're really going to see in the relevant position. So there is such a scrum down around 28th. Uh, surely we'll, we'll see some uh, some movement there. You got. I'm sure that PJ uh, Prescanis feels pretty good. Uh, in that 29th spot heading in, getting those, whatever it's going to be, 11, 12 points that will surely vault PJ up into the advance to Saturday crowd. Um, but we'll I, I think to your point, the, the big movement will be who can get into this Saturday's event. Yes. Um, the, there will be a little bit of, of meaningful movement, though, as far as the points go for the regular season, because someone like Bob Schrader had the three, and he was only about five and change out of the top four. So he's, he probably moves into third with this. Ah, uh, no, no. Cause Stephen Walsh has the three. So he'll move into fourth. Yeah. Those two though, do pick up valuable tour points, you know, so, if they, I mean, should they the, go the yeah, whole that, season without breaking with, if they don't make the exacta any week, uh, they're going to have some nice tour points for right. starters to be able to get into that, to, to get into that tournament. I like this. I like the fact that there's so much, it's like the the table in the, the Premier League. There's like every every few spots are associated with some sort of meaning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think again that was sort of when we first talked about the logistics of it. You you want to have people have every reason to play every week, a and having the ability to any given week qualify by finishing via the top two, uh, any given week qualifying for Saturday's BCBC qualifier of that week and also accumulating the points to eventually have your eight scores 
that go toward the playoffs. And whether you crack the, the leaderboard or not, that's, you know, remains to be seen, but it at least gives you every incentive to play as frequently as possible. Well put. Why don't we divide it up? You do the top 10 and I'll, I'll round out the, uh, the 11 to, to 28 this week. Sure. Number one, Eric Kurzall, 82-80. Number two, Mike Domabil, 76-20. They have locked themselves into the pl- the postseason. Uh, number three, Stephen Walsh, 65-40. Four, Bob Schrader, 59-80. Five, Peter Dressens, 58-20. Six, Thomas Nani, 53-80. Seven, Ernest Hay Jr., 53-80. Paul Cushion, eighth, 45-80. Ninth, Amy Warren, 45-60. Tenth, Jason Osterman. 4560. I will be lazy and go to names only as we go down <laughs> the board. Though I, I think I see a storyline here. Jonathan Cummings, was he on our leaderboard from last week? Did he just miss out on potentially getting a, a valuable tour point in 11th? Uh, PJ, who we mentioned, PJ Perskanis in 12th. Matt Miller, good to see that name. Uh, Chicago area horse player who, who goes into mothballs between uh, contest appearances good to see him come out of the mothballs and, and get a nice 13th though knowing him he'll be he'll be cussing that he didn't he didn't hit the top 10 and upset that he now has to look at these races on saturday uh <laughs> keith simon in 14th peter visco 15th mark henderson 16th tom harrington 17th 18th is neil metzger 19th ed reedy kevin nunez in matthew gorinchek 21st mark jacobson 22nd David Searman, 23rd. Rick Hammerly Hammer. is a familiar name. The Hammer, great to see him up there in 24th. He's getting ready to uh, have an exciting day down at Oaklawn tomorrow. Mark Henderson in 25th. Dan D 6th. With Mike Baychock. And then in 28th, making his way into the qualifier for the second week in a row, our overall tour leader, tied for that now, Truls Enga Bretson. Thank you to everybody who participated this week. Any closing thoughts from you, Matt, before we drop the curtain on this week's Horse Players Happy Hour? Yeah, look, another great turnout this week. Good luck to those of you that qualified for Saturday's BCBC qualifier. Um, but uh, just to keep in mind, and again, I know it sounds like I'm just pumping this thing. Just, you know, we want as many people to play as possible. We do. But it, it goes, you're helping charity. You're helping the overall picture of things. So the more people we can get involved in this thing, the better off we all will be. Because again, at the end of the day, without the horses, None of this happens, so let's take care of them. Extremely well put. It's a great cause. We encourage folks to give out of pocket to tbaftercare.com for the TAA, the organization that does all the accrediting for the aftercare organizations, and uh, TRF, Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. I'll even put in a quick plug. You see over my, my shoulder there, we've got last year's In the Money Whiskey. We have a new one coming out. It should drop right around Derby, and it's not for sale, but we will send one as a gift if you make the appropriate donation to the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, trfinc.org slash players for more details about the new In the Money Whiskey. I'll tell you this much about it. It's delicious. I tasted it from the barrel the other day. (laughs) It's showing very, very well. Uh, Matt, where can folks find you this weekend? Where can they find your writing? Um, give, give them the, give them the rundown. Yeah, at Bernie or underscore Matt on Twitter. Uh, you can listen to the pod basically anywhere you find your podcasts, uh, and also over on YouTube. Don't forget that. And again, I, I, say, I say it all the time with the show: you got to rate, review, and subscribe, and make sure if you're over on YouTube, the bell icon's lit up, so you get a <laughs> notification anytime in the money uploads any new content. This will be up there shortly. Um, no real writing for me this weekend from a racing standpoint. I get a little bit of a breather here. We're getting closer and closer to the Derby. There are going to be a million things going on as we inch it closer and closer have a guest lined up from monday's pod though looking forward to talking with my buddy illman again oh nice a few weeks. so i uh, we love that, be, uh, that that's a, a reunion i never tire of uh, chopping up all things derby and there will definitely be some baseball talk as well that's awesome i will definitely be checking that out myself for me at the races.com uh i'll have some stuff up there tomorrow just looking ahead to saturday races at looms boldly on Twitter, and i am put in a plug for our Derby Draft. Super fun. It's available now as a podcast, but you can also go over to YouTube and and check it out. I thought that was a, a super fun, lean and mean hour. We go over all the key contenders and have a lot of back and forth. We're really proud of the way that turned out. We're going to be back with you next week. couple of thank yous. Thank you, Matt Bernier. Thank you, producer Craig. Craig Gorbanoff, DJ Unstable himself, doing such a great job. Our friends at the Beaters, Breeders' Cup, including the departing Peter Rotundo. We will miss him 
terribly, but of course excited to see what he does next. And we know it's a great team over there at the Breeders' Cup, and we look forward to uh, continuing to work with them, raising money for charity, having fun while we're doing it. That's it. This show's been a production of the Breeders' Cup and In the Money Media. On the In the Money Media side, our business manager is Bubble Boy, Drew Coatney. Our chief creative officer is Jonathan Kinchin. I'm Peter Thomas Fornatal. May you win all your photos.